Today, for good news, we're going to hear a lot of good news about what's happening at the Tamaquag Museum in Exeter, Rhode Island, on Summit Road. And with us here is the executive director and daughter of the founder, I believe, Lauren Spears, who's here um, with a, a doctorate in various things, but certainly concerned to educate us all of us uh, in Rhode Island about the history of this place and the history of the people who live here. So welcome Lauren and thank you, thank you for taking time with us. I'm sure you're very busy with all of your projects and we're going to get into that in a little bit. Um, this uh, museum is in a building that was near a restaurant that was run uh, by your mother, is by that my right? grandparents, by your grandparents, mm -hmm. and they were interested in selling um, local food. Is that right? They did. My grandparents owned and operated Dovecrest Indian Restaurant, and they were world renowned for uh, having Native American foods there. People came from all over the world to Dovecrest, and uh, Tomaquag Museum was founded in 1958 and was in the town of Hopkinton in a village called Tomaquag Valley, which is how the museum got its name. But in the mid-60s, it needed a new home um, after Eva Butler, who was one of the co-founders with Princess Redwing, who was not my grandmother, but, um, but was very known and, and very connected to my family, um, moved it to the Dovecrest property. And it's been in Arcadia Village, actually in three different buildings, but in this little village um, since the 1960s. 
And now you're running basically a museum, an educational center, um, an archive, a resource center, and a base for speaking, going out and speaking. Is that right? That is correct. We do a lot of educational programs both here at Tomaquag Museum as well as around the region. Um, just in the last few months, educators from our museum have been to upstate New York and to Maine and to Connecticut, Massachusetts, and of course, Rhode Island. Um, teaching about Native history, culture, the arts, the environment, and many topical issues of the day that's in the, in the contemporary news of what's going on in Indian country, as they say. Well, uh, the loss of land must be huge in your sense of history. Is that right? The, the sense you just said to me, we owned this whole country. Why are you talking about this small piece of land, which is true? Um, how are you going about finding the pieces of land that you can retrieve for yourselves? Well, you know, the museum itself is an educational institution, and we certainly talk about all these issues, but we're not the tribal governments. Um, I happen to be a Narragansett tribal member. Our staff, many of which are Narragansett, but we also have, have had Pequot and, and Lakota and uh, Northern Ute, and you name it, tribes from all over across the country, because this is 21st century, and indigenous people mm -hmm. live all over the place. However, we really recognize the fact that this is Indian country, um, that what we think of as the United States is our homeland, and what we think of as Rhode Island today is the homeland of the Narragansett and Niantic peoples. And so we value this space. And what we try to share in the museum is for people to understand what indigeneity means, what does it mean to be indigenous and be a person or a people of this place. And so when we share with people about um, this place that we now call Rhode Island, which is really the homeland of the Narragansett and Niantic peoples, which now today are one people merged together after King Philip's War in about 1675, that this is our homeland and that who we are as a people comes from this place, our life ways, our culture, our traditions, our spirituality, our, um, the foods we eat, the clothes we wear, the, the um, materials we need to live our lives historically and through today is connected to this land and this landscape and the resources there. And so your job is to basically look through everything. So what's ever on the land, whatever is in the oral tradition, whatever is in the written tradition, whatever is in um, newly found information. So I have a, the blessing to of coordinate it all. Yeah, right? working a job that is very connected to who I am as a person. So I would say I am all those things and my staff that is indigenous, which is most of our staff, um, this is their life. They are living their life, but we have the blessing of working in a place that we get to share it with the public. We get to go out and speak to um, folks from preschoolers to elders on indigenous history and culture. We get to partner with other entities, like just recently we just did an art exhibit in connection with uh, standing up for racial justice in the Hera Gallery, which was called Where's Your Privilege? And um, we were able to connect native artists with the other multicultural artists to, to talk about this really topical issue around privilege. What does privilege mean? And who has privilege? And what does it look like? And one of our educators, um, Lindsay Montanari, who's a young Narragansett woman, uh, she was actually selected for the cover art, and she did this amaz amazing portraiture of a person, but the top morphed into a fish, and it's, who owns the water? Mm. You know, what's, a, what's our privilege and relationship to the resources that are in the water? And, and so we look at those the resources of, that are naturally yours. That are naturally everyone's, well. but is it being equitably used and how, how are things being um, misused that could in future generations be to the detriment of other people. And so we look at those topical issues, we talk about those things, we work with artists and educators um, and storytellers and culture bearers to share that story with the community through various projects and partnerships, um, creating book projects. Um, I worked with um, author Robert Geek, and we created a book recently um, called Slaves to Soldiers, the First Rhode Island Regiment in the Revolutionary War, so that we could tell that story from an indigenous perspective, because that is usually only told from one perspective. Um, in the case of that particular regiment, it was often dubbed the colored regiment or the black regiment, which erased indigenous people. 
-hmm. And I would say that one of our biggest jobs as museum educators is to recover the history, um, to tell the untold stories, to share our first person perspective and the history from an indigenous perspective, which frankly is not really told that way in mm -hmm. um, mainstream history. That's and right. so we really are working toward that expression of um, sharing that history from a full view um, and from an indigenous perspective. So you are both Narragansett and P Pequot here? Um, the, I personally am Narragansett Niantic. Um, so the museum is an independent nonprofit that is a native-run museum, but we're not under the umbrella of any particular tribe. Our collections actually span all across North and South America. However, we highlight the Narragansett people, focus on Southern New England tribes, and highlight the Narragansett and Niantic peoples. So you're, you're constantly interfacing with another culture. You're constantly aware that you're in a, interfacing with another culture. I read one quote um, of someone who's a Wampanoag who said, it's like having a moccasin on and a shoe on at the same time. We actually use the phrase, which has been passed down to us through elders, um, having one foot in each canoe with the idea that if you were to stand up in a, one canoe, it's very difficult to have balance. But the idea of having one foot in one canoe and one foot in the other takes an extraordinary feat of balance to be able to do that. And we're living in that dual life. We are um, citizens of our indigenous nation as well as citizens of the United States of America. So we have dual citizenship. Um, we also are living a dual life, um, understanding who we are as indigenous people, in my case as a Narragansett Niantic person. What does that mean and how do, how do I continue the importance of my culture and my tradition and my life ways, um, which you're living life, so you're doing that, um, but how do you continue that forward? We often say things like um, the next seven generations to come, the idea that what I'm doing in my lifetime is supposed to impact seven generations to come. And so that's how we um, try to propel culture and tradition and life ways forward, whether that's hunting, fishing, gathering, um, doing traditional art forms, basketry, weaving, beadwork. Um, you know, um, when we look at the contemporary art exhibit, you'll see things that are very contemporary, but you'll also see very traditional things like cradle boards and basketry and cornhusk dolls, but you'll also see contemporary art on jeans and uh, pocketbooks, if you will, because we're living in the t 21st century and that artist is living her life and that intersects with her whole cultural knowledge and experience and life ways and the contemporary world. So those things are intersecting and all artists that are indigenous are doing that because they're living in the 21st century. The word family is very different, it seems to me, to you, to you because family has been the way that you've survived mm -hmm. by staying together and by understanding each other and by listening to to traditions that are maybe not known otherwise? Well, family is extraordinarily important. Um, but family is very big in Native communities because they're very extended. Um, we grow up with, people would say, third cousins like first cousins, and first cousins are like siblings, and our, our communities are very intersected, and we are intersected you know on the fun things in life weddings and birthdays and socials and gatherings but we're also intersected on those difficult times in life when you lose someone and uh, and people are grieving that loss and but that's what makes a community strong because there's all those people there to wrap their arms around you and to lift you up when times are difficult um, a tribal community is a great big giant family. We all know each other. We're all related to each other. Um, if you're not directly related to them, you're related to them by marriage. And it just keeps crossing over and reconnecting. And that's the beauty of it, is mm -hmm. that we have this strong depth of community and of uh, family. And um, even when times are difficult, we're still together. You know, We're fighting with each other against 
um, the oppressions that happen outside. But just like any good family, sometimes we fight with each other <laughs> on the little things. But families are strong and, and are connected and are loving and we're all of that. And tribes are that, you know, we're a great big giant family. And so family and community is very important. In our indigenous, um, excuse me, in our pursuit of happiness and indigenous view exhibit, we talk to that. We talk to the idea of thinking of the Declaration of Independence and how it was denied us happiness through that. Um, in the Declaration of Independence, it calls us merciless Indian savages whose known rules of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. So if you talk about propaganda, <laughs> And, and vilifying and dehumanizing a people, this is what is written in the founding doctrine of this nation. And so in our exhibit, we talk to that about how it's denied us through spirituality, economic and political sovereignty, education, language, uh, family and community, health and wellness, all of those things, the historical trauma that took place over hundreds of years, but is still really taking place even today um, and through legal genocide and, uh, uh, and manipulations and, and, and uh, oppressions that can, sometimes they call them microaggressions today or micro oppressions. So those things that are happening. So we are looking at all those issues. We're looking at the history and then we're bringing it and, and weaving it together with the issues that are happening today, the current events, if you will, of the day, whether that's what's going on at Standing Rock or other kinds of environmental issues to food sovereignty, to uh, political and economic sovereignty and self-determination. But as a museum, we're sharing this information to educate the public that comes and visits us. Um, versus specifically acting as the tribal government and doing those over actions that might be necessary to do that. And from our perspective, educating people that might become leaders is helpful mm -hmm. in, in bridging that gap and creating dialogue amongst people so that they can understand where we're coming from and what we're trying to do and what is our pursuit of happiness, if you will, mm -hmm. and, and how we want to live our lives as indigenous people in the 21st century. Maybe you can show us some things that are here now in the museum. We're here in front of the contemporary art display, and I understand this is a changing uh, display because there are so many artists who are doing all kinds of integrating with traditional shapes and modern and old usage and new usage. So I'd like you to talk about this wonderful case and what looks Certainly. to me like every generation, I don't know. So in our contemporary art exhibit, we're sharing and spotlighting Southern New England artists. Um, where in 2018, it's our 60th anniversary year. So it's our goal to have 12 new exhibits each, you know, one for each new month. Uh, so come visit Tomahawk often and see the new art exhibit. So this month we're spotlighting Dawn Spears, who is Narragansett and Choctaw, um, which is another uh, tribe. From Mississippi and she is um, sharing her contemporary and traditional artwork in our exhibit and she's also featured as one of our artists in our, our collaborative gift shop as well which we have 24 artists spotlighted and so she's showing you how she's doing her contemporary art abstracts on pocketbooks and sneakers and phone cases and paintings she does these huge paintings that are much too big for this exhibit case but she also does very traditional artwork like um, the cornhouse dolls this one's called respecting our mothers and two dancers um, and for her grandchildren her the cradle boards for Quinabagan and Monogadao her two grandsons and so and her she and her husband made the cradle boards for all of their grandchildren, which they now have five, as well as showing her traditional basket making skills. Just like many native artists, they're multifaceted in the artwork they do, and they do very traditional things that they do for their family and community, whether that's making regalia or traditional adornment, like the necklace that I'm wearing that was gifted to me last year, um, and actually in 2016 when we won the National Medal, it's the museum logo design, which is stemming from uh, Eastern Woodland ba basket stamp designs, which people can see in our Winnegan Manutash, which is beautiful baskets. So each of these exhibits will change every month and will spotlight different artists throughout the year. 
and it just is a growth from other exhibits that we have that show historical art um, and now showing contemporary artists and how that continues on into the 21st century. Each artist that's represented here will also come to the museum and do workshops and classes teaching the public their art forms um, as well as doing an artist talk and or a demonstration of their artwork at the museum. So check our website frequently to see what is scheduled. So we're spotlighting in the Wunigan Minutash exhibit, which is beautiful baskets, the, the Southern New England stamp design baskets, which are very unique to Southern New England, Narragansett, Niantic, Wampanoag, Mohegan, tribes in this region. And so this is spotlighting, this particular exhibit is spotlighting some of the baskets that we have in our collection that have the stamping. But I also wanted to spotlight this um, bowl that is for our hubbub game, which is inspired by basket stamp designs um, and using the basket stamping on the outside and on the inside. So artist Silver Moon LaRose, who happens to be our assistant director, makes the hubbub games. And we teach kids and families and adults how to play hubbub because traditionally adults played the game. And it's a fun way to learn about Native culture through, through art and through a game and share culture in that way. And so the, just as my necklace is representing basket stamp designs when we created the new logo for Tomaquag Museum, um, we were inspired by the, the basket stamp designs, which are very unique to this region. In the baskets, the designs are put on by berry dyes? Uh, uh, various dyes. The dyes are from roots, tubers, um, nuts, berries, like black walnut is common, cranberries are common in this area, and different kinds of roots and tubers that create the design. And the reason why these historic baskets are so faint of color is because they're natural pigments. Today, um, I'm also a basket maker, but I would, I would cheat <laughs> and use like a manufactured dye. Then you get vibrant pops of color like purples and pinks and uh, you know vibrant reds and oranges that are just colors that you can't get from a natural dye at that depth of pigment. And so but you can get a great black and you can get these beautiful blues from nature. And, um, but they're, they're just much more subdued, the yellows and the, the oranges and the reds that are in the historic baskets. Most of these are mid to late 1800s. And so they're, they're very um, beautiful and very vibrant for the, the length of time that they've been around. But just as when we looked at Dawn's work, you see the vibrancy of color that people can use today in, in what is still considered sort of a traditional art form. It's a contemporary use of, of traditional styles. And even Dawn's artwork was originally inspired by basket stamp designs. So I think that we like to intersect the history with our contemporary culture. Standing in both canoes. Yes. Okay, I see one uh, about the powwow, and I think a lot of us hear that there's a powwow. We're never sure if we're allowed to go or we're invited, but let's go talk about powwows. This museum has a lot of personal history for you, and uh, very few people, I would imagine, own such a gorgeous dress. Uh, so let's, let's hear about it. It's in so your family. It certainly is. My grandmother, Eleanor Dove, also known as Pretty Flower, um, is the oldest living Narragansett right now, 99 years old, and she'll be aug on August 1st, she'll be 100. And this happens to be her, one of her many traditional dresses, or regalia as we call it, that was actually made by um, her nephew, Chin, who um, is a tremendously talented artist and does a myriad of different art forms. And so this is an example of a dress that you might wear to a powwow. Um, the Narragansett Annual August Meeting Powwow is the oldest recorded native gathering in the whole entire United States. I believe last year was 343 years recorded. Powwows are, happen across the country and they're native gatherings with music, dance, storytelling, uh, art vendors, food, and yes, it, they're, they're open to the public. People come to Tomaquag Museum and we have programs that teach you about what powwow is and teach you about the etiquette that you should carry when you go to a powwow. Um, and sometimes, as in last uh, Strawberry Thanksgiving, we showed um, all the different styles of powwow dance by inviting uh, the Native community to come in and do uh, a, a powwow style dress fashion show uh, led by our, one of our youth interns, which we have many 
from local high schools and colleges and um, through our Indigenous Empowerment Network Court, uh, program, we had um, a, ver a variety, six or more uh, interns and apprentices last year. So uh, probably everyone listening wants to know about Thanksgiving. Yeah. Uh, clearly you have Thanksgiving for different crops. Mm -hmm. uh, but what about stories that we tell, the legends or whatever they are? Uh, so, what is your tradition? <laughs> so I will tell you this, that we celebrate 13 Thanksgivings, one for each new moon of the year, celebrating the harvest and the gifts from the Creator. And some of those we've made open to the public through Tomaquag Museum, so you can come this June uh, to the Strawberry Thanksgiving, and in the fall we have the Cranberry Thanksgiving, and in the late fall, early winter, we have the Nokomo Thanksgiving. Um, and those are open to the public when they're hosted here at Tomaquag Museum. Nanichin Napish Ganashanan, Our Children, Our Future, is the name of the mural above that was done um, in 2005 through 2006 with the students of Nuituan School with artist Debbie Moorhead, who's Wampanoag. Um, in our community, the goal was to um, allow the children to sort of learn about the historical trauma that we've suffered through and then represent our history and culture through these four panels. Uh, the tops tell the four sacred herbs and how we use them in spirituality. Um, each panel represents the four seasons, the four directions. Um, the first panel, uh, each panel also has sort of an overarching theme and that one is about introspection, about how can you go in this very busy world full of technology and stuff to do, how can you take time to breathe and go within yourself and be reflective? And so the youth thought of um, reading a book, uh, playing the flute, uh, going fishing, doing prayer, uh, canoeing, things that you can do solitary in an environment that is meditative. In the second panel, which is representing summer, they were looking at community and family and how we come together. And so they represented that through powwow because most native kids go to powwow all summer long. Um, some go all year long. And so this is an opportunity for them to share their culture, um, to learn traditional and contemporary dances, um, sing with the drum groups. And when you go to a powwow, you see little tiny tots sitting on their dad's knee while drumming. Um, and that's how they learn. Just as Kwana was mentioning, he learned just by living his life. That's how most of us learn our art forms and our cultural uh, life ways is just through living the life that we live. In the third panel, we are looking at um, the fall, but we're also looking at, um, that's the one panel that shows the present all through to the past. And that panel is, um, talking about um, hidden messages and meanings today and how we all come at the world with our personal perspective, our lens that we see it through, and that all of us in this room together today, we each look at this work and we take from it what we know and apply our understanding on it. And so we were understanding how everyone doesn't look at the world in the same way that we do. And in the last panel, is about the, the elders telling our stories and continuing and passing on traditions to the next generation. And then it's about the, la the generation, the youth, and how it's their responsibility to pass along that culture and tradition to the next set of generations to come. And the reason why it's seven is because it's easy to maybe go out for even five generations. My grandmother will be, is a great, great grandmother, but that's, it's hard to go beyond that and so when you talk about seven generations, you're going beyond your lifetime. You should be thinking about your impact on this world and on your family and on your community and how you can push that out seven generations. So those are the teachings that they're being taught as youth that they're supposed to be applying in their lifetime. Well, I wanna thank you so much for this very enlightening discussion. I really appreciate you allowing us in and we certainly hope everyone will come down to visit the museum and to talk with you and the other people here who are doing so much to make sure that Narragansett tribal history is getting known to Rhode Island. Thank you for watching Good News Rhode Island.